big part of what we live through in pop culture these days are reboots. When an old story, an old concept is told again with modern filmmaking, shall we say, in the case of the movie medium. Special effects are updated, or sometimes projects are updated just to keep the IP around and alive and perhaps find a new generation. Sometimes this can be a huge hit. Other times it's a reminder of how good the original was. And, well, I mean, obviously one of the kings of the reboot would be something like the Batman franchise, right? We've had a new Batman movie. Well, at this point, we're getting them every uh, couple of years. It used to be a lot more spread out. In fact, we'll revisit that in a moment. Although, if you're going to go for a single movie, it probably is going to be A Star is Born. I think that's had the single number of actual remakes of a particular plot. All right, so why does this happen all the time? And in the toy industry, too. Well... It's because it's a bet. It's a sure bet. For example, let's say you want to make a movie, you want to make a toy line, you want to make a book, you want to make a TV show, you have to go to someone who can fund this, right? Unless, of course, you are independently wealthy and we happen to have the funding to do this. And if you're going to make a content, shall we say, out of existing IP, intellectual property, well, it's a lot more alluring to go with something that has a very high or large fan base, something that's popular. If you're going to do a character like Batman or Superman or Spider-Man versus someone like, oh, I don't know, Flaming Carrot, right? As cool as he is visually, and we all want more Flaming Carrot action figures, please, universe. Well, that is why, also in the toy industry, you see reboots. Why we're on, oh, I don't know, Masters of the Universe 5.0, is it at this point? Where it's more or less the same story, just updated, or Star Wars is, you know, at 9.0 as far as, you know, in you know major movies. Well, I guess there's been like 12 of them, but all right, I'm talking about the actual episodes. The point being is that surefire popular properties get picked up because they're popular, because they're more or less not necessarily a sure thing, but they're a much higher success. If you are making a Spider-Man or if you have access to making a Spider-Man movie, there's a good chance it's going to do very well, just because Spider-Man is a very popular hero and already has a fan base. All right, so that brings us down to how long of a period of time between reboots, if you will. And as you can see from this chart, and I'll throw up a Batman one in a moment, the time is getting, it's shrinking, where it used to be a lot more time. Like, we're talking, you know, I mean, in the case of Batman, decades, right? I mean, gosh, between the Adam West and Michael Keaton, we're talking about the 60s to the 80s. Now we're getting a new Batman movie every, I think the average is two and a half years at this point. So we're reaching a point in cultural saturation where main characters, popular characters, are getting constant content, as opposed to going back and reflecting on how great the content was. You know, you remember this one-off book or movie or TV show. So how does this work in toys? Well, it's very similar. Obviously, very popular lines are going to come back because there is a very good chance they'll be popular again, like when Hasbro slash Kenner took it the chance of bringing Star Wars back in 1995, despite the fact that it had been off-market for almost 10 years and there was no new content out at the time. Granted, it was a great bet for them because new content started coming, but it was a bet. Nonetheless, it was still a bet on a popular property. And it's interesting to look at how, while the first wave had all of the main characters, as the years rolled by, Hasbro slash Kenner started coming up with more creative ways of getting the main characters out there, finding variants, finding different outfits that they'd worn, even if it was on screen for just moments. The idea was that Wave 1 represented the definitive version of characters in their most popular outfits. So in this case, you know, Tatooine Luke. And while there were other Tatooine Lukes that came out in the first few years of the modern Power of the Force line, they tended to be tweaked a little bit. Like, this Luke has a headset on and a Stormtrooper belt, because that's what he wore when he was in the gunner station. Or this Luke here is wearing his micro-binoculars, and uh, he's more, well, he's right off of the farm. This is sort of farm boy Luke, shall we say, as opposed to, you know, Jedi in training Luke. Now, eventually... Jedi in Training Luke from Movie 1 did get a remake, and by that I mean a single-carded figure release. It seems like when they're in two-packs or three-packs or with vehicles, it doesn't really count in a weird way. It's only single-carded figures that are looked at as redos. If a figure shows up in some un otherwise like different configuration, meaning a multi-pack or an exclusive, 
fans don't tend to look at it as the defin- the redo of the definitive version. And once that door was open, in the case of Hasbro Kenner for Power of the Force 2, well, once fans accepted that it was okay to remake a figure they already had, well, Kenner slash Hasbro, I'm just going to call him Hasbro at this point, started pumping out more and more, knowing that this was one of the most popular versions of Luke Skywalker, so why not capitalize on that? Yes, you could give him slightly different accessories, but it was more or less the same figure. Versus in the 80s, you only had one Tatooine Luke, and that was it. Now, as the years went by, this, let's call it, you know, A-list version of an A-list character came out over and over again, sometimes in straight repacks with new packaging, sometimes with a completely new figure from the ground up. Keeping a well-known version of a well-known character is very similar to rebooting a movie over and over again. You know this character sells, so why not always keep him on shelf? Well, of course, toys are not without their sense of irony, and this version of Luke is actually really the only one that, that's been, uh, I guess, up to modern standards. Ironic as it is that this ver- the most popular version of Luke hasn't even made it into the current uh, vintage series, if you will. I mean, the vintage series, which is kind of the definitive version of Star Wars 3 and 3 4th, it's obviously chock full of Luke Skywalkers, but they're all the other, you know, the variants of him. And while Hoth Luke or Jedi Luke, you know, Ninja Luke, as kids would say, is popular, and it's great for collectors to get figures that either came out in the very tail end of the vintage line, like Luke as a Stormtrooper, or who were never even offered, like Luke in his uh, Yavin 4 medal ceremony, whether it's called Luke Skywalker Yavin or Ceremonial Luke, he gets different names, or things like Luke on Dagobah. These are characters that we didn't have as kids, so getting them in the modern line is a bonus, but it's a variant of the version that is most well-known. Luke in his white outfit is by far the most popular in mass culture. Yes, Stormtrooper and Jedi and uh, X-Wing pilot are absolutely well-known and recognizable, but it doesn't take away from the fact that movie one, or movie four, Luke Skywalker in his white outfit is the one that's most recognizable by the public at large. And the closest we've gotten for the vintage collection is this version, which is uh, what Death Star Escape Luke, where he, again, has a Stormtrooper built, but this time no headset because he's not yet in the gunner station. I know, I know. So technically, every five minutes, Luke picks up something different in the movie. All right, let's get off Star Wars and look at a different example. Marvel Legends. So Marvel Legends went from Toy Biz to Hasbro, and in doing so, it sort of opened the door for all of these older figures, like Thor here in the Toy Biz line, to get a remake by Hasbro. And so that, so bringing back the main question is, how much time has to go by? With toys, it tends to be, well, almost a decade before a figure tends to get revisited. Not always, but usually, and it seems that fans expect that they're going to get updates of figures, but they want them to be separated enough that there's a noticeable upgrade, improvement, it's an overall better figure. And we've seen this with Marvel Legends. For the most part, the Hasbro ones are better, unless, of course, the Four Horsemen sculpted the original Toy Biz one. But, yeah, overall, Hasbro has the better version of a Marvel 6-inch articulated figure. You know, if you were going to just go for a big category. But this doesn't mean that toy companies don't want main characters out there, too. One of the ways that we handled this at Mattel was by packing more obscure releases of main characters as all-stars and re-releasing them. It's the same thing that Hasbro does with the Black Series. All right, so all of this, with this as background now, really gets us to the point. On one hand, you have toy companies wanting to have main characters out there for new fans, for older fans, for casual fans. So Boba Fett, as an example, has been repacked multiple times. The original release in a box in the orange-carded Black Series, if you will. He was one of the earliest figures. Well, this is considered, if you will, a collectible item, or when Boba Fett got re-released for San Diego Comic-Con. Again, highly collectible. Granted, he had some unique accessories in this point, but now that Boba Fett has been re-released over and over again, well, there's something about the monetary value of the collectible, not just, you know, what it's worth, but really the status of saying, I had this figure, I was there 10 years ago and got it. So then when the figure is redone, suddenly the value of the figure or the status of owning that figure is diminished. It took me decades to build this Jabba the Hutt palace little diorama. I mean, these figures came out over the course of 30 years. So there's a lot of pride in that, 
And if they're all just reissued the way, say, Boba Fett, Six Inch, has been multiple times, does that take away from the collectability of not just the figure, but the entire line? Knowing that, oh, if I have something special, it's only going to be special for so long. The way I think the best way to handle this is just simply with heads, refreshing the same figure, but with a new expression. It's a great way to keep the figure on market or at market without upsetting the collectability and the status of owning the original. At least that's the solution that I think works best. What do you think? Should toys continually get re-released? Should they be updated? Should they remain the same? Or is there some way that they could change but maintain the collectability of the original? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Do you have any good examples of figures that have come out and disappointingly reduced the value of an older figure? Love to know your thoughts, and I'll see you in the comment section. Thanks for sharing and watching.